wholesome in our lives when we were young. You know, oh sorry, Disney even decided to kick Pinocchio out for hate speech simply because he said, I'm a real boy. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. I'm glad everybody's here. Uh, it's great to be. I tell my wife every time we come back from the feast, when you get around a large group of God's people, it is tremendously comforting. And like minds coming together, and this is kind of a, you know, it's a springtime that we all get together. And we've been up here before. We haven't made it the last couple of years, but it is, I appreciate everybody being here. So it's making my stay here much more fun. In the 12th chapter of Matthew, in verse 38, it says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The world clearly rejects this sign, and we are in the midst of the weekend where even unknowingly they reject this sign. Oh, oh I thought someone was asking. Uh, th where, where they reject this sign, you simply can't get three days and three nights from Good Friday to Easter, sunrise, Sunday. And, and as I said, this is going on right now. The title of this is The Great Miracle. When you read the Bible, what do you consider to be the great miracle that is talked about with regard to mankind? And there are many that could be considered. In First and Second Kings, we have a lot of examples of great miracles that would, uh, you would think would make people say, wow, I know that... Uh, that was an example from God, you know, Elijah and Elisha. And I'm, not, I'm just going to pick one out, but I'm going to go to 2 Kings 6. And I'm going to start in the first verse and read through 6. 2 Kings 6. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell so he answered go then one said please consent to go with your servants and he answered I will go you know that's a that's a pretty good move right there if you read just the, the couple of chapters before that you can see that Elisha was a man of God and he would have been a good asset to go with him they would have thought that because you know he uh, he he petitioned God on many times and God answered him he was a man of great faith so he went with them, and they came to the Jordan and cut down trees. But as one was cutting uh, down the, a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place, and he cut off a stick, and he threw it in there, and he made the iron float. So God suspended the laws to allow this to come up. Now, that would impress me. It had to have made this man very elated. And you got to think about this in today's world and in what was going on here. You know, it's not like this man could have gone down to the local Lowe's and bought another $25 and bought another axe as we live in a very convenient society. And these things, we, we, <laughs> we live in such a convenient time. We have stores we call convenience stores that we will go in and pay three times as much because we don't want to drive an extra two miles because it's kind of out of the way. We're like a bunch of tabbies eating fancy feast on pillows. <laughs> but uh, this would have been something. This, you know, the iron was, was, was mined. It had to have been uh, uh, forged and sharpened. And as we heard from Michael, it was very good today. You know, you might have had to go see the Philistines to get this thing done. <laughs> Who would have wanted that? And I'm sure he had made an extreme promise to take care of it and bring it back to its owner. What kind of an impact would that have on me as far as witnessing a sign from God like that? Could God have allowed that ax to stay in the water and this man go through another different type of trial? Of course he could. But this was a blessing granted for this individual. 
who would have obviously been in a situation had he not returned the property to its owner. My question is, how long do you think the appreciation that this man had at the time for God remained? Did he get over it after a certain amount of time? That's one of the examples of a miracle. I'm going to turn to what most people would probably consider to be the greatest miracle, one of the greatest miracles, the Exodus 14. And everybody's very familiar with this story. Exodus 14, and starting in 13. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Lift up your rod and stretch it, your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. It's interesting, uh, as Mike was talking about archaeological uh, things that to us are just fascinating because it's like, wow, this is physical proof of what happened. Well, they recently, I don't know how long ago it was, have discovered... Uh, the site where they crossed the Red Sea. And I was showing this to Michael after he talked on uh, the Bible study. And it's about a mile deep in that area. And they have seen chariot wheels that are, uh, that have the certain amount of spokes that date to that time that the Bible lets us know. And of course you have people that will uh, you know, you're going to have your, your critics that, you know, they say, well, no, they crossed in this other area. And I can't even remember. It was a long time ago. There was some guy who was a, a science guy. You know, they call us science deniers. But he, uh, he said, well, you know, he tried to explain it with these, you know, hurricane force winds and tides and stuff. And it really wasn't that deep. And they were able to get across right there. But it says here they crossed on dry ground. And now, like I said, there's been uh, proofs of this where they crossed. Indeed, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. And then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud of darkness to the one and gave light by night to the other so that one did not come near the other all that night. There is another great miracle if you were to see that. I mean, would that stick in your head long enough? Would that convince you? Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went in the midst of the sea, the dry ground, the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on the left. And, you know, I know human nature, and I know this, but if we were sitting there, I mean, you're probably like, who's, who's, who's going first, you know? Because <laughs> you've you got to imagine that this is, you know, reading it, I don't think does, does any justice to if you were there. Can you imagine the sounds? Can you imagine? I mean, this is a, 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 in the water a mile deep. You would have felt this. It, you, there's so much power holding this back. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them, and in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning, watch the Lord. The Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the armies of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians a little too late. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, and the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, not so much as one of them remained." But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead 
on the seashore. Think about if you were there, if you witnessed that. The noise, as I mentioned, that you had heard the shaking of the ground, the panic from the witnessing of such an event. There, everybody must have been, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of people that were saying, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, the whole time they were walking through there. There's a lot of people that were frightened. The kids, can you imagine the chaos? I'm sure these people were crying out loud. And then when the waters came back over the Egyptians, how hard did that shake? If you would have been there, wouldn't that have been enough to keep your mind focused for the rest of your life? Apparently, it wasn't enough for Israel. Turn to Deuteronomy 29. And we'll read 1 through 9. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all of his servants and to all his land. The great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. To perceive, my margin says, understand or to know. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. I wear out a pair of shoes in about a year. <laughs> That's a pretty good, pretty good pair of sandals, isn't it? That's a pretty good God. I'd say. You have not eaten bread, nor, you have, or, nor have you drunk wine or similar drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Why? Man does not live by bread alone. And when you came to this place, Sion, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, came out against us to battle, and we conquered them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. There was an important ingredient missing. The calling of God. The acceptance of his call and the opening of one's mind. I was talking to Michael about that. Some we might say the switch gets turned, the light gets turned on. We have a couple of different analogies that we say, but this is why it says an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. That's going with God on my terms, not his, right? Hey, God, I, I don't believe you do this for me. Show, me. show me here. Show me over there. It requires a connection made by God and the individual's cooperation, unlike people who claim to be Christians and say, all you have to do is believe. There's nothing else. No. I have to, these things you say, I will do. You have to answer this call. The weeping and the gnashing of the teeth will be the ones who realize they ignored a calling. Back in Matthew, where I was, talking about this calling, Matthew 22, I mean Matthew 12. But starting... Did I want to start in 22? Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and the mute man both saw and spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? I have to overcome myself, folks, don't I? He who's not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. God makes it possible for me to overcome myself, doesn't he? Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. You know, if you're a believer of the Trinity, that doesn't make sense, does it? That puts that mystery character above Christ. And if you know the Father, you know the Son. So where does the Father fall in that? Well, how does that work? I'm not trying to confuse y'all. Y'all know what the Holy Spirit is. The Spirit of truth. What comes to us from the Father. Repent, be baptized. Hands laid on you. Receiving of the Holy Spirit. This is what gives us our faith. This is what gives us our conviction. That's what it's about. Being convinced and convicted of the truth. I know people out there who... We'll read this and understand it like, like an elementary, a kid in elementary school. You, you can read this and you can say, well, yes, that's, that's true. The Sabbath is the seventh day. Yes, this, these are the days you're supposed to keep. Yes, these are the dietary laws you're supposed to do. But then they will walk on and not be convicted of doing it. They will not have something inside of them that says, I have to do this. Even unto death. Think about it that way. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, our God can clearly protect us. But if he decides not to, we're walking into that fire. They were convicted in their hearts of this. Uh, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account to it the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. We have received God's Holy Spirit to help us to stay on that right path. And then I come down, then the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. The great miracle that I see is the divine calling God does on those whom he has mercy on. I did nothing. I did nothing to be here today. Other than answer the calling. I, did, had, I had nothing to do with him calling me. But I had, to, I had everything to do with answering that call. And he gave me his Holy Spirit to be able to do that. None of us are here today because we figured it out. We were granted a great miracle to take place within our minds. And now to walk with God's own Holy Spirit. This is something of great magnitude. This is something, if the world knew about it, they would want to take it from you. For now, we are just by the world's measure considered fanatics. But the spirit world knows a bit more than that, don't they? This special gift can only be identified by others who are experiencing the same thing. I, 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 have, a, I have a loving family, a great family. They just don't get it. They won't get it. Not until God allows him to get it. I, I said an analogy to this. Um, because we're all, in this room, we're called. And we all have certain crowds we know, people we talk to, each and every one of us are ambassadors to God's truth. And we all walk down different paths. 
But I think a, a good analogy of this is it's like, because everybody here in Texas knows football, right? And, and, and God the Father is the owner of this great football team, if you will. And Christ is the coach. And we have assignments that we're given. And if I'm asked to come in on a play, I don't worry about what the play before happened and some so-and-so dropped the ball or this or that. I'm concerned with what Christ has me doing. And it's just like when Christ answered Peter about John, if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? Christ is my personal savior. He lets me know this truth that is in my mind today. This is huge. And what I know, I must stick the course and stay with. This is, a, this is what I'm calling the great miracle because you can read this stuff to somebody else and they will not get it unless that miracle has happened within their mind. And I, I was thinking, I didn't turn to it, but you know how, uh, I didn't write it down, but we're, I think I did, hold on. I'm going to turn right here real quick. Matthew 24, 22 through 24. Because this used to kind of make me nervous when I would read this, because I, I, I know that I am very flawed. I know that I fall very short of, of, of the glory of God, and I trust God. I don't trust myself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I want him to help me make my decisions with that Holy Spirit that's lying within me. And, but it says, unless those days are shortened, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And then if anyone says to you, look here, there's Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So there's going to be some pretty fancy stuff happening. But I, because I have had this great miracle happen to me, can know and identify, can't I? And he expects me to pay attention to what... He has given me the knowledge that he has given me to follow him. And I'm going to turn to an example in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 13, that I think a lot of people, if you were to read this to people, or if you were to read it to a group of lawyers today, they would have a fun time going about and bantering about what's wrong with this. But there's an important lesson here. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child Josiah by name shall be born in the house of David, and on, on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall be split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, who cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him. Then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered, so that he could not pull it back to himself. The altar also was split apart and ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the, of the Lord. Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. Now he seeks mercy, right? So the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. Then the king, now he wants to be buddies. And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread, drink water, nor return by the same way you came. So he went another way, did not return by the way he came to Bethel. He followed the instructions that God had given him. He had made this known to him. Just as God has made known his truth to us, and we should not stray from it in any way. Follow it unto death. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works this man of God had done by the, 
that day in Bethel. And they also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, which way did he go for his sons uh, Saul? And they saddled up the donkey. I'm going to move down here because I don't have to read all this. Uh, and then he came to him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return with you nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. And he said to him, I too am a prophet, as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back to, uh, with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. He was lying to him. So he went back with him, ate bread in his house, and drank water. And it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man saying, of God who came from Judah saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord, you have not kept my commandment, by which the Lord your God commanded you. But you came back, ate bread, drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread, drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. And that's what happens. Don't you know lawyers would sit here and try and divvy out this blame and say all these different things. But this man had direction from God. He knew. And it doesn't matter that he was lied to. I'll tell you what, the world's going to lie to you all day long. God doesn't lie. God doesn't lie to us. And that's what we need to keep in our minds, in our hearts, that conviction of truth, that we will follow him no matter what. Christ is talking to the Father and looks and speaks to his disciples and sheds light on the greatness of this miraculous gift. Luke 10. And just 21 through 24. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father. And who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. That is the great miracle that has happened to us. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see. A king, a king had power of life and death, didn't he, over people? He could have anything brought to him in this world. Here it says, For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. This is something that is either you got it or you didn't get it. Not to be used in an effort to boast or to condemn or to be set under your mattress for a rainy day. It is to be regarded as a blessing. An absolute miraculous gift that I can see and understand these things. To be appreciated. To make me humbled. And to show to others who might be potentially called in the midst of this absolutely crazy world. This is the great miracle that to the world remains a mystery.